the reason why this particular webinar is of importance is because it centers around a particular figure who, um, although may not be as well known as those who appear on the cover of Time magazine or uh, CNN's Top 100, he um, is an influential figure, Abdul Baha, a man who a hundred years ago uh, completed a lifetime of service, inspiration, and his life um, had a great deal to do with promotion of a number of central concepts in Baha'i philosophy. The most central one is, of course, unity, but also he was a promoter of justice, of socioeconomic welfare and of unity. With those thoughts in mind, we're going to turn over to our wonderful panelists, perhaps starting with Jenna. Maybe just start with a few words about the importance of unity in the world of business and what learnings, what insights, what policy recommendations we could perhaps uh, tease out from the life and writings of Abdul Baha. It's really a, a pleasure to to be with all of you and see faces joining from from all around the world. So it's um, you know really an honor to be here. I think this question of you know what can we learn um, and to reflect on as it relates to unity within business and particularly what we can learn from from Abdul Baha in terms of you know insights and reflections uh, is sort of more relevant now than ever. I and mean, I think we've seen this you know over the last. 18 months in particular, as the as the world has um, struggled with identifying like how to best respond as it relates to, to the COVID crisis, the awareness around uh, racial justice and the importance of racial justice, and what are the implications of all of these factors within business and how do businesses effectively respond to these um, ongoing so sort of crises and sort of this dual pandemics of structural racism and, and, and COVID-19. And what's powerful when we you know, look at the writings of, of Abdul Baha is that it really outlines a blueprint in many ways for how we can you know, think about some of these elements within business. So some of the uh, kind of key principles that Abdul Baha and the broader you know, Baha'i writings, I think really Abdul Baha in many of um, his writings really encapsulated, and I'll name just a few um, and we can dive into to, to more. Um, but one concept around just this idea of, of service is a line from Abdul Baha that says that like, work is worship and work done in the you know, spirit of worship. And, and even if we could spend a whole session just diving into that one phrase, right? And, and when we think about the concepts, you know, so often when we think about the concept of worship, people will naturally think about you know, being in a physical place of worship and, and praying to God. But this idea of how do we really inculcate these spiritual principles in how we interact with fellow employees, how we interact and, uh, with our customers, with our partners. How do we think about um, kind of this idea of work as worship as we're thinking across the whole, whole supply chain so that it isn't something that just starts and ends in words, but it is really translated into how we're we thinking about questions around pay equity and, and profit sharing. And there are actually writings from Abdul Baha that really talk about you know, these concepts of, of profit sharing and the importance of equity. When we look at principles around um, the equality of men and women, which is also a, a principle that Abdul Baha you know, stood greatly for, and how are we thinking about in our hiring, recruiting, onboarding, retaining processes, uh, how we ensure that the equality of men and women is is in captured. Um, when we're thinking about questions around sustainability and the, the idea of the ongoing uh, impact, both literally in terms of you know, the environmental impact, and there's a lot of passages from Abdul Baha where he talks about the interplay between us and, and the external environment and world and the, the interrelationships there. So there's many of these different dimensions that and having that intentionality is whatever role we may play within businesses, whether it's in, in leading you know, organizations or being entrepreneurs within larger organizations to uh, look at how we can encapsulate some of, some of these principles. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jenna. Um, before we, we move over to our next panelist, I just wanted to read a little excerpt from some of the words that Abdubal has shared with us that I think really encapsulates the notion of unity at its grand, granular level and high level. He says, reflect upon the inner realities of the universe. 
the secret wisdoms involved, the enigmas, the interrelationships, the rules that govern all, for every part of the universe is connected with every other part by ties that are very, very powerful and admit of no imbalance. The statement, it really um, digs into the notion of unity and how it needs to be and in every um, sphere of human interaction. So with, with these words of Abdul Baha in mind, we're now going to turn to Amin, our next panelist. Good evening to all. This is Amin Egea from Barcelona. Thank you very much for reading that uh, quotation from the writings of Abdul Baha because it is very interesting to see how Abdul Baha in many of his public talks in the West, um, from 1911 to 1913, he visited the West and was invited to many platforms and by many platforms and organizations and universities to address the public. This was after 40 years of imprisonment. So it is very interesting that he stressed very much this concept that all reality is one single system. And then each part of this system is in connected, is connected with any other part of the system. So what happens in one corner of the system affects the others. So this is a very interesting way in reading of reading reality. So imagine we have a business or business can have an impact on environment, environment on climate change, climate change on human migrations, human migrations on international policies, international policies on domestic policies and so on. Everything is completely interconnected. And when we read reality, seeing this system as a whole of which our business or, in the, or, or individual lives or any aspect of our lives is part of it. When, when we read reality, seeing this whole reality as one single system, then that affects very much the way we act and the way we plan and the way we estimate and calculate the results of our efforts, either in our individual lives or in our professional lives. And part of this system, which is one and of which each part is interconnected with each other is also moral reality. And moral reality is not disconnected from material reality. So we have a set of moral values such as justice, solidarity, service, um, excellence, etc., that cannot be separated from the rest, the rest of the system, the rest of reality. So in order to have a current business, a current endeavor in our lives, we need to take also into account that other part of reality, the whole set of moral values that, that govern, govern this whole system and try to apply them not only in our individual lives, but, only, but also in our endeavors, in our business or professional lives. There really isn't exactly as Abdul Baha says, um, no separation or no imbalance between different elements of uh, human experience. So what we do in the world of business has a direct bearing on our personal or social, economic or environmental lives and, and um, vice versa. So um, uh, perhaps we could uh, focus on a couple of issues that Jenna, you highlighted in, in your remarks. Do you want to say a few words more about um, the concept of sustainability, perhaps? Definitely. No, I would be happy to. And it's, um, you know, I think a lot about, there's a key principle in the Baha'i writings that Abdul Hassan talks a lot about of how do we become, you know, is, there's a quote that says, be anxiously concerned with the age in which we live. Um, and this idea of really looking at this interconnectedness with the world that both um, Amin and Tahereh have have talked about, but the the idea that if we are able to, rather than seeing the world outside from us as, as separate, but rather instead seeing how are we interconnected with one another and with the world, how does that then lead to the solutions that we design? So um, one of the organizations that I'm part of Impact Experience, and we do a lot of work actually at the intersection of climate and racial justice, and a lot of principles around you know, racial justice and racial unity is also a lot of what Abdul Baha talked about. And the, the idea that as we're thinking about questions around sustainability, that unless we're looking at 
what does this mean in terms of the communities that are living on the front lines and will be you know, most affected by, as we see climate change impact and climate migration, um, the, the need to be able to um, kind of engage you know, around, around some of these topics. Um, I think that one of the concepts around sustainability that becomes really important that um, Abdul Baha you know, talks a lot about um, is the idea of the harmony of science and religion and the power of being able to have the scientific principles that can out, outline and be the blueprint for how we think about you know, some of these other you know, aspects. There was a, a passage when Abdul Baha was talking in Paris, there's a book compilation called Paris Talks, and, um, and, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll share it. He said, consider the world of created beings, how varied and diverse they are in species, yet with one sole origin. All the differences that appear are those of outward form and color. This diversity of type is apparent throughout the whole of nature. Let us look at the beauty in diversity, the beauty of harmony, and learn a lesson. Right? So this idea that what we see within nature in terms of you know, its diversity and the celebration of that and how that leads to the flourishing of the, the broader natural environment, what does that then mean in terms of as we're looking within businesses and uh, looking at the interplay between businesses, you know, how can we build from those insights from the natural world, um, you know, within the design of, of, of our organizations. Very well put. Thank you so much. I think um, when we're talking about the issue of diversity, one of the things that perhaps um, comes out quite a bit in, in um, Abdul Baha's lectures in the West, as well as his writings, is um, the issue of attaining diversity in terms of participation of women and men in every sphere of human activity. So gender equality was central to the discourses that Abdul Baha introduced um, to many philanthropists, businessmen, scientists, and, and social movers. Reflecting on the issue of gender equality, which is very much alive today. In fact, EBBF had a post today about um, an article from, from The Guardian here in the UK talking about how we actually need um, more feminine qualities in terms of leaders that we choose and leaders who occupy um, uh, powers, uh, seats of power around the world. I mean, um, do you have any words to, to share with us on this important topic? Yes, it is very important to note that when Abdul Baha visited the West, he was put in contact with almost all the major suffragist and feminist organizations in the West both in the US and in the UK. In the UK, for instance, he met with Evelyn Pankhurst and with his head daughter, Christabel Pankhurst. He gave a talk to the suffragists in London, uh, which was attended by more than 1,500 uh, women that acclaimed him as a defender, as a defender of women's rights. And he had a very progressist and new for the time discourse on women and gender equality at a time, and this is very important to note, at a time when science was saying that women are naturally inferior to men, that feminine biology makes women inferior to men. And despite the scientific truth of that time, that fortunately science today has completely reversed. Despite that, Abdul Baha was very emphatic and very strongly defended the rights of women. And one of the reasons he, he said that there should be an equal treatment of men and women and both should enjoy the same rights among them and above all of them, the right of education. He said, it's not just a matter of justice, it is also because social progress is dependent on gender equality. He compared mankind with a, uh, with a bird with two wings, one being man and the other being a woman. And he explained with this very simple but beauty, beautiful example that as far as both wings are not equally strong, the bird cannot start its fly, cannot fly. In a similar way, as far as men and women don't enjoy the same rights and are not equally strong, don't have the same strength, mankind cannot progress. To Constance Maud, who was a very famous London suffragette, 
he explained that social progress is not possible in this or any other nation until men and women enjoy the same opportunities. And the most important of these opportunities is the opportunity to education, to receive education. It is very interesting to know that despite that he has spent, despite the, fa the fact that he has spent more than 40 years in, in prison, from his prison, he directed, he led the Eastern Baha'is, especially in Persia, to establish and open schools across the country. And many of these schools were schools for women. And in many of the cities was, where these feminine schools were open, these were the first schools for women ever. And in these schools, girls would receive the same education as boys in other schools. And if in a few years, there was a whole generation of young women who were capable in a country like Persia, so backwards in terms of gender equality at that time as Persia. In a few years, there was a whole new generation of young women, Baha'is and non-Baha'is, both of them, who were able to read, to write, who were skilled in some sciences or in arts, who themselves were starting other schools, opening and establishing other schools, and who themselves were, would be teachers in other schools, who proved these Baha'i principles, this Baha'i principle that if you grant women the same education as men, anybody would see that men and women are exactly the same. So this applied to our days, this basic principle applied to, to our days, it still is very significant. Uh, most of the world, in, in more than half of the world, is still women do not enjoy the same civil or social rights as men. The other, the other day I was uh, giving a talk, a virtual talk uh, for Peru, and there was a vice minister on, 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 for women of the country attending the, the, the panel. And it was interesting to see how much way needs to be uh, worked still in so many countries in terms of uh, equality. And when we look at the world, we see that there's more progress and more advancement in those countries where there's more gender equality than in those that there is not, when, when they, where there is not. And if we apply this to our families, we can reach to the conclusion that our family can progress and can advance if both the male and the female members of the family enjoy equal rights. And if we apply this also to our businesses and our companies, we can also reach the same conclusion that our business or company will advance most if both the women workers and the men workers enjoy the same rights, same privileges, same status, and more important of, the, of, of everything, they enjoy, they are listened the same and they partake in the decisions of our company in the same way. Those are incredibly important points. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, the principle that you have just shared with regards to um, uh, equal access to rights for women and men applies universally. And it really begins from our family relationships. You know, we, we in, the, in the world of um, gender equality, we often talk about equality from, you know, bedroom to boardroom that, you know, may not necessarily be the, the best way of putting it, but it definitely is the most universal way of expressing it. Because if within a family, in particular, men and boys demonstrate whether, you know, we have all sorts of families these days, we have nuclear families, we have separated families, we have multiple parent families, we have all sorts of families. If men and boys uh, begin to practice and highlight the presence and contribution of women and girls in their families, then our businesses and our world at large will begin to shift in terms of its access to resources. And of course, access to resources is at the heart of another dimension of unity, which Abdu'l-Bahá has talked about in many of his writings, and that is what we are dealing with today is what we see as extremes of wealth and poverty. And the gap between the haves and the have-nots, the, the wealthy and the poor is, is widening by the minute. Um, Abdu'l-Bahá has addressed this in his writings directly to those who are involved in the world of business. 
And one of the things that he has really encouraged is the notion of um, owners and workers sharing profits of every business together. So I'm wondering, Jenna, uh, with your with your um, strong presence in the world of impact investment, is there anything you wanted to share with us with regard to Abdu'l-Bahá's work and and um, insights into profit sharing? It's just so exciting to think that you know over a hundred years ago, you know, Abdu'l-Bahá was talking about these principles around profit sharing. That now you know it's great to see the you know, the impact investing community and corporations you know trying to uh, work out ways to design these principles, but where we really have the you know the foundations that we can we can build from from Abdu'l-Bahá. So I'll, I'll share a, a, a passage. Um, where Abdu'l-Bahá sort of talks about this concept around profit sharing and then share a few reflections on it. So this is from the Foundations of World Unity. And uh, he said, the owners of properties, mines and factories should share their incomes with their employees and give a fairly certain percentage of their products to their working men in order that the employees may receive beside their wages some of the general income of the factory so that the employee may strive with his soul in the work. And so, and this is obviously within the context of, you know, the factories and what have you, but the idea that this really being the, the, the base that we can build from for all different types of, of organizations and, and, and businesses. And I think that there's a number of ways to, to approach this. One is purely as it relates to retaining talent. So when we think about, and we've seen this, you know, most recently with the sort of the great resignation, but you know, a lot of challenges that, um, companies are facing in terms of how do they retain talent, how do they attract talent, that um, organizations that are really at the front lines of, of looking at innovative ways of both profit sharing, but also of more cooperative models where there's um, ownership structures, where, where the ability to be able to have mechanisms in place that you know, one of the other core Baha'i principles that Abdu'l-Bahá talks a lot about is concepts around consultation. Right? When you're thinking about the mechanisms for having consultation when people are literally owning in that business or are benefiting from the, the profits that are generated from that business, it shifts fundamentally how people engage in terms of agency uh, when we're having conversations like around consultation and, and what have you. Um, within the broader kind of impact investing community, and for those of you who are newer to the concepts around impact investing, it's really the idea of how do we integrate a consideration of the social and environmental impact into investment decision making processes that these concepts around profit sharing are becoming more and more popular a lot of investors when they invest into companies are asking questions now of you know how are you thinking about ways to uh, compensate your team members and this really beyond just executive roles but how do we really think about this across everyone within the organization such that um, people that may be newer to the organization and in more junior roles are also part you know of that broader broader ecosystem and seeing this this shift from it just being a niche part of the broader investment landscape to really kind of mainstreaming now such that uh, you know within even more institutional investors and, and organizations um, that they're also looking at, at many of these principles as well. Thank you very much. I suppose um, what we are talking about is a seismic shift in how we have conducted business so far to, to really be mindful of the impact that we're having, socioeconomic, cultural, health, environmental impact that we have. These are very important elements that Abdu'l-Bahá is introducing to the world of business. So that places us um, either as business leaders, innovators, um, you know, those who are new in the field, we need to assume a posture of learning. All of us, regardless of how many years you may have been involved in this space, um, particularly with the dawn of the pandemic and how it's, you know, redefined everything and continues to redefine everything and, you know, create the new normal, as they say, with, you know, um, experiences such as the great resignation that you refer to. We really do need to engage in, in a culture of learning that is central to our um, engagement in the business world, and in fact, in every field. So that calls for two elements that Abdu'l-Bahá sort of perhaps placed as the foundation of learning, and, and they are consultation and collaboration which again are gaining momentum and importance in the world of business. I mean, would you like to say a few words perhaps about the importance of consultation and collaboration and how 
they help to change the culture of business based on the fundamental uh, variety of unity. Yeah, sure. Before that, I just wanted to add to what has been said that Abdul Baha put that principle of sharing uh, the benefits. He put this ideal into practice himself uh, when he established some farming communities in the Middle East, in the Jordan Valley, which were very successful and which he used to to feed the population of Haifa and Akka during the First World War, World War and save hundreds of thousands of lives thanks to those farming communities that, that he established under this rule of sharing the income, also of keeping something in case of emergencies, et cetera, et cetera. That's something very interesting that needs for, for the study, but was indeed very successful because in the middle of the First World War, he was able to send periodically food to Haifa and Akka at a time that only in the Lebanon, on, at that time, 100,000 people died of starvation. But in the region comprising Ark and Haifa, this did, didn't happen because of this assistance that, that he offered. Regarding consultation and cooperation, I think this is one of the key issues that our world needs today. You know, we are still inheriting from social Darwinism, which by the way, was, was at its climax during Abdul Baha's life. We still have inherited this idea that any progress, any advancement is dependent on competence and conflict, right? Um, the more conflict, the more, the more uh, progress. And still many people think in that way and in any human field, even in sports and any, anything, anything we may think, people still say that the more conflict, the more contest, the more progress. Now, what, what Abdul Baha explains is that exactly the opposite is true. He says, he says that it is not contest or conflict or division that is the axis of progress, but it is cooperation and unity. And, and he explains this by taking two examples from, from natural reality. He says in existence, in any existing being, the atoms are united, its atoms are united to each other as, as soon as they separate, as soon as they divide, that being stops existing. And any living being, for any living being, it's the same all the cells of the living being are united to each other as soon as they divide, as soon as they separate, as soon as they enter into conflict with each other, then that living be being dies. So he says that the rule for progress is exactly the opposite. It's not contest, it's not conflict, it is cooperation. Now, how can we take cooperation, cooperation into our daily lives? What's the method to apply cooperation into our daily lives? That is the process of consultation. Consultation from the Baha'i perspective, from what we know from what Abdul Baha taught in, in his writings and in his talks, it is, is not a mere dialogue between people or mere debate between people. It is more than that. It's, searching together into reality, doing a research into the reality. And at the same time, is a method in which we apply several moral values. We express our opinions with humility. We, we promote unity, even if no matter how, how, how we think that, how much we think we are right in our opinion, our opinion is the right one we prioritize unity. And there's a set of moral values that need to apply in consultation in the way that Abdul Baha explains the concept that create the environment in which several people can search into reality, do a kind of a scientific research into reality, and then come to a conclusion, come to a decision, and then apply it. It is something that when it is explained, looks like simple, but, but when it is put into practice, it is quite complex and difficult because we all tend to use the tools of the contest culture. 
we tend to to prioritize our egos to try to make sure that our opinions are enforced and are are applied etc etc and it's very difficult and to today if we see any level of human activity for instance if we look at our politicians we still see that culture of contest that culture of conflict as and division as the axis of the method and this is a mistake and we see the results every day however if we go and we see a scientific team in an unknown laboratory somewhere in the world we see quite the opposite we see diverse people with different opinions what but working together in order to research into reality and then they come together with a conclusion and they publish it in a paper and that advances the science and then advances um, human progress. The same thing should be done in, our le in all levels or in our lives, at the family level, with our friends, in our religious communities, at our work, in our companies, everywhere. We need to apply this principle of consultation and cooperation based on these moral principles. And this is something that, again, Abdul Baha did not only explain at the theoretical level, but he also put it into practice. And in fact, he created a whole world community, transnational community, that, that since in inception in the 19th century, it's learning on how to advance in this process of cooperation and decision taking uh, using the method of Baha'i consultation. And, the Baha'i community is a work organization that has over a century of experience in this field and can, and can manifest that the results and the fruits of this method are quite important and at least more efficient than other methods that are applied currently in our world. Building on what you um, just shared with us is perhaps another concept that exactly as you said, not uh, only did Abdul Baha talk or write about, but he actually exemplified um, through his lifetime. And that's the concept that I think when we're talking about a number of different challenges in, in our world today, including extremes of uh, wealth and poverty, really stands out. And that's the concept of moderation. How do we moderate our business activities so that we um, remain focused on these inherent dynamics of unity between our environment and our economy and our individuals in society and our organizations and our communities and all the elements that, that make the stuff of life. Turning to moderation, perhaps, as something that could probably define um, a number of uh, dynamics in terms of impact. Jenna, what are your thoughts on moderation in our business world today? Thank you for the question. It also links back to um, you know, what Tari, we were talking about earlier in terms of also looking at the social and economic divide and what we've seen and just over the last 18 months is whilst you know, some of the impacts of, of COVID has had the most acute impact on you know, marginalized communities and low-income communities, we've also seen some of the wealthiest people in society become even wealthier, right? And, the, um, and what's interesting in terms of this conversation around moderation is the idea of that's being really advanced you know, here within the US right now around a wealth tax and you know, a lot of this discourse around, you know, how do we create opportunities both, you know, more broadly within society, but also um, within businesses. So there's a lot of discourse around, you know, how do we think about the differential between the highest earning person within an organization and the lowest earning um, person within an organization so that we are creating opportunities to decrease that gap. So we're not seeing you know, this, this huge um, differential. Um, and there's a there's a, a passage from, from Al-Dabahar in, in some answered questions where he said, it is preferable then that some measure of moderation be achieved. And by moderation is meant the enactment of such laws and regulations as would prevent the unwarranted concentration of wealth in the hands of the few and satisfy the essential needs of the many. And what's interesting about you know, that passage is that in many ways, that's you know, talking about the laws and structures of society and that this balance of how do we think about mechanisms that both need to come into place from a, from a policy level and that will be instituted that will be applied to everyone. And then what is also the role that 
individual business owners or even business units can play in terms of ensuring that this moderation uh, is achieved, even in terms of you know, how are we engaging with one another? And again, this um, how are we engaging with you know, vendors and suppliers where you know, we're so often business is focused on you know, how are we uh, you know, maximizing profits and financial returns. But if we rather think more broadly around when we think about concepts around fiduciary responsibility, if we are not thinking about kind of the impact of our decision-making processes on the broader environment, like there isn't, there won't be a world that we'll be able to, um, you know, prosper within. And so this concept of moderation, you know, also just has very real implications in terms of decision-making processes uh, within organizations as well. Absolutely. When, when you were t- talking about uh, the laws and regulations and the fiduciary responsibilities of businesses um, that could um, enable us to balance access to wealth and to, in fact, really from what Abdu'l-Bahá was proclaiming, is not so much that we want to bring the wealthy down, is that we want to elevate the impoverished to a level where they have, everyone has access to their basic socioeconomic needs. It's, it's at the heart of all of this is the notion of human nobility or, or in human rights lingo, dignity um, that must be observed. In other words, the main aim of business activity must be to serve the preservation and promotion of human nobility. In fact, uh, in one of his talks in Paris, he said that you know, we look at uh, much of our what we call developed world. So, you know, when you're in a state of comfort, ease, health, and success, pleasure, and joy, Abdul Baha is right. We can be, um, you know, very happy. But then he goes on to say, but if one will be happy and contented in the time of trouble, hardship, and prevailing disease, it is the proof of nobility. Um, our world today with the pandemic in here in the UK with, with the supply chain issues that we're facing, um, not just because of the pa- pandemic, but also Brexit, some of the other challenges we're having, um, prevailing diseases, which of course we were suffering globally. Um, there are many individuals that are having to turn to the concept of nobility in decisions that we are, business decisions that we're making in order to ensure that everyone um, enjoys this concept and, and develops it and furthers it in their personal life. So in the development of their self and society. So thinking about perhaps Abdu'l-Bahá's understanding of nobility, I mean, what are your, your uh, recommendations? If you were to give three top recommendations to every business to promote uh, human nobility, what would they be? Three? <laughs> uh, well, uh, one thing, let, let, me, let me share a few ones, a couple on this. Um, one thing uh, which is actually very much uh, related to moderation is that Abdul Baha invites all of us, mankind as a whole, but also ourselves as individuals, to try to reach an equilibrium between our material achievements and our spiritual achievements. He says that material progress is like a lamp and a spiritual progress is that like the light in the lamp. The lamp alone with no light is useless. We need both. So no matter how much progress we progress in our material achievements, in our professional, economic, and health achievements, whatever, we should never forget also to earn some spiritual achievements. And this is exact. This this spiritual progress is actually part of our nobility. When Abdul Baha speaks about the spiritual progress, he's not talking about being able to speak with the other world or something. He's talking about progress in moral values, to progress in our patience, to progress in our humility, to progress in our honesty, in our mercy, in our, you know, in the way we treat others. This is a spiritual progress. So it is a balance between, so we need to always reach a balance between or material achievement and our ethical values. Otherwise, our our individual lives and our social life, when I say social life, I mean actually the life of society 
will always have a very bad end. As we can see today, we have advanced so much in science, economics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but at the same time, we see around us lots of unhappiness, inequality, injustice, and problems that we have today that nobody would have thought about them 100 years ago, like climate change or new diseases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a proof that material progress by itself is not enough to reach happiness, we also need to advance in our spiritual side. And this applies not only to our individual lives, but also to the life of society of mankind as a whole. This is one thing. Then another thing, <clears throat> of course, seeing every human being as equal to us means that we recognize this in them the same nobility that we may presume in ourselves, right? So in order to see this nobility in others, we need to transcend uh, some categories in, in such as race, nationality, religion, gender, uh, political inclination, whatever, and to dispel from our minds any kind of hate or animosity towards any human being always remembering that they have, uh, as human beings, they have a noble side. And so one key aspect to promote or to recognize the nobility of any human being would be to recognize our equality as human beings. Of course, unfortunately, we live still in a world in which our primordial identity, which is our identity as human beings, is completely forgotten. And instead of it, uh, still other minor and accidental identities are promoted, like our racial identity or sexual orientation identity, etc., etc. Instead of that, we should look at our primordial identity. And this is something that Abdul Wahab would do every time. And the best example of that is the way he would treat his enemies. The people who were responsible of his incarceration for 40 years, the people who tried to kill him, the people who, who would write about him all sorts of things, the immense love, the immense uh, affection he showered upon all of them instead of hate or instead of responding them with any negative attitude. That's by itself a good example for any human being to follow. He would often say, if you receive poison from anybody, return to him honey. So that's, that's something he would do in his daily life. And there are many stories about that. And that's something we should also try to do ourselves. Um, in fact, it's very interesting to look at the lives of some of the individuals who, um, uh, like Abdul Baha, over the past century, have made tremendous contributions to the world of humanity. How um, their success and their blossoming um, has happened in the midst of um, crisis, loss, and conflict, perhaps in their personal or their community lives. Some of the individuals, just like Abdul Baha, there some of them, some of his enemies were, were, you know, individuals in society, maybe rulers or or decision makers, but also members of his own family, who uh, treated him um, in in ways that were not necessarily conducive to unity. Yet he completely, utterly, and consistently maintained his own focus on unity. And perhaps the reason why, one of the reasons why it's important to talk about the life of Abdul Baha, particularly when it comes to business, is that business essentially is a community of individuals coming together to um, take part in socioeconomic activities. And um, in the lifetime of Abdul Baha, he went from being a child prisoner, right? He was, he was a nine-year-old boy who was then exiled away from his home community. By the time he was exiled to the Alcatraz of that time in the city of Akka. He was surrounded, he and his family were surrounded by individuals who wished them ill and inflicted every kind of disaster on his life. 
But by the time he passed on a hundred years ago this week, his funeral is a historic phenomena that's studied to this day because you read the tributes that individuals of all backgrounds who were essentially his ill-wishers and his enemies, by the time he passed away, he had transformed them so much that they all came together and said, we lost our father. So if we act in the same way in the business community, imagine Jenna can talk about this, about the impact we will have. How are we going to make this happen? How are we going to put unity at the heart of my business, whether I'm running a law firm, I'm running um, you know, a, a social impact investment uh, fund, I'm running a doctor's clinic, I'm running a consultancy firm, I'm running a naturopathic clinic, whatever it is that we're doing. Abdul Baha says, some men and women glory in their exalted thoughts. But if these thoughts never reach the plane of action, they remain useless. The power of thought is dependent on its manifestation in deeds or actions. So if we want to make sure that the webinar we've been taking part in tonight, so the minutes that we've been spending together, the hour we'll be spending together um, is not in waste, is not useless, we need to each go away from this webinar with at least one decision, one action that we're going to bring to our business to ensure it increases unity. Because more than ever before, the world is divided to us and them. And more than ever before, we need unity, be it from our hearts and minds, the rise of mental health, to profit sharing, to policies, to um, geopolitics, to every space you look at, we need unity now. We need harmony now. So, Jenna, if, if you were to give us, you know, again, three recommendations that may um, be useful to all of us in, in different spaces in terms of bringing unity into the businesses that we're in, involved with, what would they be? So I think one is actually uh, having the frame of asking this question of like in this situation, in response to this email, in response to this conversation, in response to this um, decision that we're trying to navigate, like what is the most unified way of engaging? And I've, I've even been reflecting on that as we've all been talking. I had received an email this morning and I was like, what do I do about this? And I'm like, oh, from the perspective of unity, how would one approach this? And I actually think there's a frame in, um, in negotiation strategy that some of you may have heard of, of like got walking to the balcony. And, and I think that in many ways, actually asking the question of like, what is, and I, I mean, one could even say like, what would Abdul Baha do? But I think, or what, 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 what do I think Abdul Baha would do? But um, in, a, in a more focused way in terms of this conversation, um, saying like, what is the, what is the, the, what is the perspective from the place of unity that would enable how I would respond to this situation that enables one to sort of to literally sort of walk to the balcony of take a, a step back from, I think so often we can become in reactive mode to, uh, to what is being presented and being able to kind of take that step back in order to kind of engage. I think this piece around the power of our mindsets, you know, there's a, a line that Abdul Baha said of when a thought of war comes, oppose it by a stronger thought of peace a thought of hatred must be destroyed by a more powerful thought of love. Like that's literally a concept that as we are negotiating, you know, thinking about how we engage in a situation of what is the more loving, peaceful way to, to engage in that situation that I also think is a tool that is always you know, at our disposal. And just realizing that we all have more agency around uh, you know, so many of these decisions than we may realize. You know, with a company I work with, One Planet, we ha actually have a culture manual that is all based on principles from the Baha'i writings, and but a lot of the principles that we're talking about today. And we just actually yesterday had a, a retreat that was all looking at how do we ensure that in every aspect of the way that we're running meetings, in the way that we're you know hiring people, in the way that as we're dealing with negotiations of contracts that we're um, embedding these principles into every aspect of our processes so that it's not something that starts and ends in words, but really does translate into core policies and, and behaviors. So a few reflections. Wonderful. So, so perhaps one of the first things that we could all do within 
our sphere of decision making um, at whatever capacity we serve in whatever organization we're a part of to immediately have the intention to promote unity. And with that intention, then every consultation, every action we engage in is um, going to promote unity and enable us to take the words that we have uttered in this particular space tonight into the realm of action. So I think um, it would be lovely actually if we could join the next EBBF event. Uh, we could re register for it um, through the EBBF website, um, their event page. Um, thank you again to EBBF for organizing this timely webinar. Um, thank you to our panelists, uh, Jenna and Amin, for uh, taking the time to speak with us. As we can see, poor Amin is actually really suffering from, from a bad flu, but he's here. So thank you again for your interest in this topic. Thank you to EBBF for everything. And let's keep the conversation on unity in business and the impact of Abdul Baha's life on the coming century going. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.